spent funded by dues and internal money, and the other third we had to get somewhere else. So it's very difficult to get 100%. And that's why we create some of these other programs, depend on our own campaigns to help fund us, and, you know, wherever we can get money. But dues still builds the backbone of the organization because there you have something that nobody can replace, which is a base that you're accountable to. Real people paying real money actually help you raise money, too. It's not just you and a rat in your pocket telling them what a great idea you got. And, you know, why don't you just give me 10,000 pounds and, you know, I'll do it. It's you and a lot of people you're working for trying to do something that is critical to them. And if they can put up their, you know, and look, the Unite dues are what, 30-something pounds a year? 26. 26? Yeah. Which is no dues, I mean. So, you know, we're charging about 60 pounds a year, 5 pounds a month in Bristol. So, you know, and that's going to be hard at that number to get what they need. In Canada, our dues are $15 a month. Um, but in the poorest slums of the world, we collect dues that are equivalent to that. Three soles in Peru. 50 to 100 rupees a month in India, because people know the organization is that important to them. So if, you're, if you know, as, as you're making the point, how precious their resources are, kind of puts more weight on you to make sure the organization delivers. This is not just a, you know, a good job for somebody. This is a mission for people to build an organization because they really believe what you have some skills to help build with them may change their lives. Now that may be worth 50 rupees a month. From the better union movements, I see, you say like more kind of red unions have this policy of organizers. More what? Red unions? Well, yeah, I know. What's that? Left. Oh, okay. <laughs> English to English translation, thank you. Basically, you know, like, like um, have a policy of like the organizer basically subsisting on a similar income to their the constituency there represents I think it's one of the problems of you're not so I'll be paid by thirty three grand to organise unemployed people. You know, like I think these things are a, a problem, you know. Yeah. I'm not, I mean I've been unemployed for seven years so I kind of understand the thing and I know where the, that money's how it's gonna go. But but do you have a, a similar kind of concern about well do you pay what do you do, what's your relationship between organizers' wages and the constituency that you're working with? Well, uh, in our union, the union organizers can't make more than 10% of the average wage of our members. That's our union, uh, because we organize low 10% more than the average wage of our workforce. Um, but we have a salary scale that is approved by the membership and is not great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe a little low. <laughs> but it's a living wage, by God. Um, and it's, uh, you know, and look, in the, our autonomous structure, I don't even know what their salary scale is. But in the salary scale I administered uh, within the U.S., you started at uh, two and a half times minimum wage. And then you got an increase every year. There's an automatic cost of living increase as set by the Department of Labor. Every year when it came out in January, that January 1st, and then every four or five years, we took a look at the entire scale and bumped it up. Now, that never meant it was great money, and it always had a relationship to whatever the minimum wage was. So, you know, if the minimum wage in the U.S. has you starting full-time work at, uh, you know, roughly 15000 and we start people at, you know, 27, or 20, 24, 5 or something like that, that's actually one, one and a half times the minimum wage, not two and a half times. Uh, math shame myself. Um, but that's, that's the rule of thumb we did. We wanted it, you know, we were never trying to force people, you know, to be Franciscan priests. But it's a membership due system, and the membership had to pay, you know, you had to know you were going to get paid what the membership could afford. And Can I just clarify something? It is subsidized by the richer sections of the work. Of your trade unions that are set up. It's like no, I'm explaining like, Acorn right there. Yeah, I'm explaining why oh. not, that we're not taking all that money from the other employees. Oh, okay. Oh. The you know, organizers, that's how we work. Let me address your uncomfortability. 
When I went to work for Welfare Rights, I was 20 years old, and I wouldn't go to work for them unless they agreed to pay me as high as the best organizer who worked for them. So if other people and other organizations make their judgments based on money, then my view is you have to demand what you're worth. And that's what I bring to bargaining contracts for my members. But if everybody is together, all I want to be is with everybody else. So if you're going to have a, a picks and chooses salary schedule, I want to be right at the top because you value people by money. In ACORN and as organizers, we don't value people by money. We value people for the work they do and the time they spend and their seniority. So everybody is invaluable to us. But if it's a union that believes in that structure, then I think don't ever lose a minute's sleep. If that's how Unite pays, demand the top dollar of what you're, top pound of what you're worth. That's my view. But like I say, neither am I a job counselor, so. <laughs> Okay, so other people, how much more time do we have? I know we started a little late. We may have people jumping 15. in any minute. Yeah, it's 10 15. Okay, good. Questions? Oh, where's my landlord? Okay, well, I, I promised him. I promised him first, but you know, I guess I drove the landlord out of the room. I didn't mean to, but. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks, Wade. It was uh, really great to hear about Econ. Um, like, wins are really important in order to build an organization, you need the, the victories um, and what Bob was talking about, so like gaining some sort of power. In this Couldn't country, agree more. Yeah, in this country, power is so centralized that in order to have a win in this country, like, you know, a win that really impacts people's lives, um, but I think it, it needs to be, you know, can be something on a fairly substantial scale. Well, I know in, in the States you've got a bit more of a, kind of like, um, a federalized system where those powers can devolve a bit more of a local level. Um, and whilst I, I do like the the idea of like the model of, of Acorn, I just feel like there may be like some kind of challenges in this country of, of, about making that work. Well, we actually have the same problem because more and more you can't win. I mean, more than half of the states are controlled by Republicans. You can't win there, so you have to win federally. And it's almost I mean, you can look at the problem poor Mr. Obama has trying to win a damn thing these days. You know, uh, he has to leave the country to get respect. Um, <laughs> But, <laughs> so what we did is start going after corporations because we believed in many cases we could leapfrog over the bureaucratic political jurisdictional problem in the U.S. given how huge it is and you know we may have been big but we weren't big enough, never big enough. Um, so that's why we ended up in looking and targeting companies specifically. even big companies like Walmart to see where their operations intersected our membership and communities in such a way that we could dramatically impact them and in some cases use them to build. So the number of private corporations we went after because of exactly that strategic problem, I think you're exactly right. And, um, but I also think it's the way we have of going after some private targets. In Edinburgh uh, right now, we were able to get a list of somewhere between 15 and 20,000 uh, people who lived in multiple tenant MTOs, multiple tenant occupancy, septic. This whole abbreviation <laughs> thing, let me tell you, in the UK and in India, it's, it kills me. Um, <laughs> but MTOs, then, I'm not, you know, money transfer organizations, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so we got this list. So. That list gives us an opportunity to what I call a minimum standards campaign to try to contact all tenants, not just those who live in a couple of buildings, not those with just one or two leasing agencies, but to try to go, go big, go after all 15, 20,000, try to get the money for a mailing, door knocking in places where we want to move them, try to move quickly to see if we can jump out ahead of this election coming up. We actually win if we can make a huge mess. I'm not saying um, this is like the last. Look at me, this is no anarchist here. Um, we, we build highly disciplined organizational structures. But anytime you can create an upset, established order, our organizations have an opportunity to win. If we can force our issue of tenants right now in Edinburgh on the sort of agenda, we think we can make it a bigger issue than just those 15,000 tenants. But that, because landlords are actually, if, with enough scale, we, we muscle up pretty good on a lot of landlords. In Toronto, some of them have units with five, 6,000 tenants. 
that's a harder fight. These ten, these landlords in Edinburgh, two Z's, three Z's, four Z's. That's you know, you don't have to be that big to all of a sudden, relatively speaking. I mean, this is part of the political concept of weak and strong links. By putting enough people together who have weak links into something strong, we actually can do much better against landlords. And we're already finding some leasing agencies. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll give you. We'll give you a year or two year lease. Is that what makes it okay? Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. You know, even before we start the campaign. So I do think, yeah, let's look for some private targets. And let's look for some that may leapfrog. What city are you in? Uh, London. London. London sounds like an interesting place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. What do I know? Yeah. I Leeds, think, right? Newcastle. 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 I was going to say as well, I think another one that's maybe winnable more quickly is the welfare rights stuff. People having access to the benefits that they should have. A lot of people don't claim what they could claim. And that's something you wouldn't necessarily need to have. A yeah, I wrote a whole book about this. I mean, I really believe in maximum, you know, maximum feasible benefits. Any entitlement, it's so hard. And this is the same problem in Canada, the US, or anywhere we work. You can't win a new benefit right now. I mean, look at what's happening to healthcare in the US. It's like a battle zone there. But we can get huge results from maximizing participation in existing benefits, and nobody knows how to do it. And we're, we're creating actually citizen wealth centers throughout southern U.S. in order both to resource the organization, because we're charging small fees to pay for the staff, but also to make sure everybody gets every bit of health care they have coming, picks a plan, gets, you know, we have a, a database that will track 15 federal and state programs and sell if you're eligible for them. I mean, these things, I mean, computers are actually useful. You wouldn't know that I know anything about them from what I just, you know, my PowerPoint demonstration. But, you know, I think they're, they're good tools. But yeah, I think that's exactly. And you can push up some rates on some things. But I don't know enough about the system here. In Canada, we're actually having some success at the provincial level on moving up benefits for certain disability provisions. Um, it's a big, there's been a, a, a compression down on benefits there as everywhere else, but by organizing specific groups of people, we've been able to uh, have some impact in getting some, some of the caps released and pushed up. And that's, that's unusual for us now. So I don't want to get too deep into this issue, but question? Comment? It was just thinking back on it. We had 500,000 members, and I think at the present time we've got 100,000. And what was sort of, how did it come to that? Was it, or was the particular issues around the nations at the time when you had 500,000? And you know, that's why you had that many. Does it depend on the sort of reaction or the campaign and things like that? Do you get a big fall off, or do you manage to keep? Well, organizations are either growing or dying. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much the iron law of organizing. In the U.S., I left the organization June 2nd of 2008, and that was the membership. In 2008, there was a presidential election. We registered one and a half million new voters in the presidential election where Obama was originally voted in. And it targeted the organization for the Republican Party. And in 2009, there was a resolution that was passed at the congressional level to make sure that none of the programs related to 168 different organizations, including labor unions that had ever touched ACORN, would ever get any federal funding. So that meant a lot of these bank agreements, because the banks were all bailed out after recession, they then retracted their agreement on advice of their lawyers. Unions like the service employees, we were contracting to provide organizing services for four or five million a year. Were, you know, had to withdraw their support. So the leadership and staff of Acorn after that attack had a lot of difficulty keeping the organization alive at that size. So they made the decision. I wouldn't necessarily have done this myself, and I was working <coughs> elsewhere. So once you leave, you leave. You can't really, you know, go pitching in your two cents later. Made the decision to reformulate the organization into various states and to disband the national organization in November 5th of 2010, 2010, in order to try to have as many of the pieces survive. 
Now, unfortunately, the predictable outcome of that is that the strongest of the organizations, you know, somewhere we have 38 state organizations, so about 12 of the states continue to this day robustly, uh, still working, but many of the states that were more marginal didn't survive under this sort of rebranding or whatever. Um, so that's what happened to that half million numbers. Now the day I don't think about it too, but that's not to say I also waste the day of my time regretting the fact that we built something that strong. I mean, that's part of the problem of power is that then all of a sudden you're face to face with, you know, as much power as you can handle and unless you can take the wave and take the punch, you've got a problem. And, you know, I never really thought in all my years there that I was ever going to be invited into sleep in the Lincoln bedroom. And I think some of the leaders and organizers got a little confused after I left that, hey, we helped elect President Obama, and we were part of the difference, and we took the hit, and, you know, he's going to stand up for us. And, you know, President Obama has to stand up for President Obama. He didn't, you know, he didn't mind throwing an acorn into the bus. And I think they just got disoriented about what they thought was going to happen to them as a part of that. And so yeah, so it's, you know, rebuilding time. Yes, sir? Yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, what percentage of the, the, the dropout was due to probably people not affording to pay your membership that dropped out from that? Zero. Let, let me just tell you the facts. I mean, you all need to, let's, let's get an open mind going. There's a lot of surveys, there's a lot of evidence. Contrary to what you believe, the lower income you are, the more philanthropic donations you make as a percentage of income. This is the fact, even in the UK, this has been surveyed, Pew Research, independent, not Wade Rathke, and friends, okay? <laughs> I can tell you, as organizers, from 1972 when we instituted the dues system on, some of my organizers originally were people I sort of hustled from a program much like your program, we're called BISTAS. Volunteers in Service to America. They were one year commitment, government funded people, and they didn't know what to do. And I find them, you know, sort of hanging out, smoking, you know. Come on, <laughs> come on, you want to be an organizer? Let's go. And uh, I didn't have any money to pay any people. I was starting something from scratch. I mean, there were weeks I made $32 one week, $38 one week, $16, you know. When you first start a do system, you're, you eat what you kill. Uh, you know, it's not like, oh, you know, hey, I was making, you know, $8,000, I mean, can't I get 8000 you know, well, no, 20-year-old kid, you get out there, and, you know, I was 21 when I started Acorn, you, you make what you make until you get that dues system up, and it's remarkable how much you learn to collect dues in that situation, <laughs> but I don't want to get out, well, what the organizer would find, they'd come to the staff meeting, this one woman, this organizer was a visitor me, Donna Parsiak, I'll never forget it. She was so embarrassed. We were going around the table, people, you know, talking about the groups. She had this one group in North Little Rock, across the river from Little Rock, a very low-income area called Dixie, 100% African American. And she didn't think she'd been doing the work in that neighborhood that she really thought they deserved. She hadn't been over there as many times as she as she was handling three or four other groups in Dixie, but they were paying dues. I mean higher than any of our other groups, and they were collecting it. Their treasurer, we actually changed the name of our local elected treasurers to dues collectors. So their percentage of dues payment to members was higher than any of the groups she was handling. And of course, that turned out to be borne out by statistics over and over again. Lower income, people understand how they use their money, they're, very, they're more generous with it than higher income. So it had nothing to do, of all the problems Acorn had, that wasn't the problem. We learned how to collect dues. It's something, it's a, it's not a natural thing you're born with, it's a trainable thing. We about finished? Yeah, seems okay. Mark? I was just going to ask, um, you, you uh, did some work in voter registration. Yes, we did. Um, is, that, is that something you've generally done across the world, or is that uh, mostly a Canadian or, or American thing? You know, it depends on how many restraints there are on voting. In many of the countries we work, particularly in Italy, Latin America, voting is mandatory, registration is automatic. Yeah. So it depends on how much the effort is to suppress low and moderate income votes. I mean, I don't even know what the system is here in the UK. But believe me, if all of a sudden you have to register, that's an effort to keep any of our people from voting. You know, whatever it's sliced and diced as, I mean, <laughs> there's still been no voter registration fraud ever, yet there, 
There are like 30 states in the U.S. There are 30 states that have passed, you know, ID laws and whatever. So, yeah, we did a lot of that because that's the way you're forced to participate at all in the U.S. Um, in many countries, it's not that way. And then the other thing we do is get out the vote. I mean, we don't have mandatory voting, so even if you don't have registration systems, in many countries, we do everything we can to get our people out to vote. And let me be honest. If you go on our website and look at Peru and a number of our, you know, Argentina, a lot of what we win in terms of big victories in Latin America, we win on the eve of elections. Uh, it's the way the system works. If you're mobilized and you're organized and you're in the face and they've probably <coughs> got to go to come to La Matanza or San Juan Lerigancho. Gancho, I mean, we've won parks and school constructions and potable water and I could, you know, the list of things we've won right by being you know, aggressive on GOTV and aggressive with our membership on political candidates when they were desperate to have those votes. And when they got, it's, it's harder to win. But there are elections here too. And uh, as, there's always leverage in elections. There's always marginal districts. There's always places that if you do the research, you can find there are lower mo low and moderate income people might make a difference in certain situations. I think we're about finished. Need to. Any final question? Just to the one margins thing, the going session on the United community, there's one tomorrow as well, but today also I want to just talk about um, like challenging like, how, yes, from the United community point of view, all the 